Attention, Interflight Ship. Attention. You are ordered to land at the control station on Dymos for inspection. Attention. You are to land at once. The metallic rasp of the speaker echoed through the corridor of the great ship. The passengers glanced at each other uneasily, murmuring and peering out the port windows of the small speck below. The daughter rock that was the Martian checkpoint, Dymos. What's up? An anxious passenger asked one of the pilots, hurrying through the ship to check the escape lock. We have to land. Keep seated, the pilot went on. Land? But why? They all looked at each other. Hovering above the bulging inner flight ship were three slender Martian pursuit craft, poised and alert for any emergency. As the inner flight ship prepared to land, the pursuit ships dropped lower, carefully maintaining themselves a short distance away. There's something going on, a woman passenger said nervously. Lord, I thought we were finally through with those Martians. Now what? I don't blame them for giving us one last going over, a heavy businessman said to his companion. After all, we're the last ship leaving Mars for Terra. We're damn lucky they let us go at all. You think there will be a war? A young man said to the girl in the seat next to him. Those Martians won't dare fight. Not with our weapons and ability to produce. We could take care of Mars in a month. It's all talk. The girl glanced at him. Don't be so sure. Mars is desperate. They'll fight tooth and nail. I've been on Mars three years. She shuddered. Thank goodness I'm getting away if... Prepare to land! The pilot's voice came. The ship began to settle slowly, dropping down toward the tiny emergency field on the seldom visited moon. Down, down the ship dropped. There was a grinding sound, a sickening jolt, then silence. We've landed, the heavy businessman said. They better not do anything to us. Terror will rip them apart if they violate one space article. Please keep your seats, the pilot's voice came. No one is to leave the ship according to the Martian authorities. We are to remain here. A restless stir filled the ship. Some of the passengers began to read uneasily. Others stared out at the deserted field, nervous and on edge, watching the three Martian pursuit ships land and disgorge groups of armed men. The Martian soldiers were crossing the field quickly, moving toward them, running double time. This inner flight spaceship was the last passenger vessel to leave Mars for Terra. All other ships had long since left, returning to safety before the outbreak of hostilities. The passengers were the very last to go, the final group of Terrans to leave the grim red planet businessmen, expatriates, tourists, any and all Terrans who had not already gone home. What do you suppose they want? The young man said to the girl. It's hard to figure Martians out, isn't it? First they give the spaceship clearance, let us take off, and now they radio us to set down again. By the way, my name's Thatcher, Bob Thatcher, since we're going to be here a while. The port lock opened. Talking ceased abruptly as everyone turned. A black-clad Martian official, a province later, stood framed against the bleak sunlight, staring around the ship. Behind him, a handful of Martian soldiers stood waiting, their guns ready. This will not take long, the later said, stepping into the ship, the soldiers following him. You will be allowed to continue your trip shortly. An audible sigh of relief went through the passengers. Look at him, the girl whispered to Thatcher. How I hate those black uniforms. He's just a provincial later, Thatcher said. Don't worry. The later stood for a moment, his hands on hips, looking around at them without expression. I have ordered your ship grounded so that an inspection can be made of all persons aboard, he said. You Terrans are the last to leave our planet. Most of you are ordinary and harmless. I am not interested in you. I am interested in finding three saboteurs, three Terrans, two men and a woman, who have committed an incredible act of destruction and violence. They are said to have fled to this ship. Murmurs of surprise and indignation broke out on all sides. The later motioned the soldiers to follow him up the aisle. Two hours ago, Martian City was destroyed. Nothing remains. Only a depression in the sand where the city was. The city and all its people have completely vanished. An entire city destroyed in a second. Mars will not rest until the saboteurs are captured. And we know they are aboard this ship. It's impossible, the heavyset businessman said. There aren't any saboteurs here. We'll begin with you, the later said to him, stepping up beside the man's seat. One of the soldiers passed the later a square metal box. This will soon tell us if you're speaking the truth. Stand up! The man rose slowly, flushing. See here! Are you involved in the destruction of the city? Answer! The man swallowed angrily. I know nothing about any destruction of any city. And furthermore, he is telling the truth, the metal box said tonelessly. Next person! The later moved down the aisle. A thin, bald-headed man stood up nervously. No, sir, he said. I don't know a thing about it. He is telling the truth. The box affirmed. Next person, stand up! One person after another stood, answered, and sat down again in relief. At last, there were only a few people left who had not been questioned. 
The later paused, studying them intently. Only five left. The three must be among you. We have narrowed it down. His hand moved to his belt. Something flashed. A rod of pale fire. He raised the rod, pointing it steadily at the five people. All right, the first one of you. What do you know about this destruction? Are you involved with the destruction of our city? No, not at all, the man murmured. Yes, he's telling the truth, the box intoned. Next! Nothing, I know nothing. I had nothing to do with it. True, the box said. The ship was silent. Three people remained, a middle-aged man and his wife and their son, a boy of about twelve. They stood in the corner, staring, white-faced at the later, at the rod in his dark fingers. It must be you! The later grated, moving toward them. The Martian soldiers raised their guns. It must be you! You there, the boy! What do you know about the destruction of our city? Answer! The boy shook his head. Nothing, he whispered. The box was silent for a moment. He is telling the truth, it said reluctantly. Next! Nothing, the woman muttered. Nothing. The truth. Next! I had nothing to do with blowing up your city, the man said. You're wasting your time. It is the truth, the box said. For a long time, the later stood toying with his rod. At last, he pushed it back in his belt and signaled his soldiers toward the exit lock. You may proceed on your trip, he said. He walked after the soldiers at the hatch. He stopped, looking back at the passengers, his face grim. You may go, but Mars will not allow her enemies to escape. The three saboteurs will be caught, I promise you. He rubbed his dark jaw thoughtfully. It is strange. I was certain they were on this ship. Again, he looked coldly around at the Terrans. Perhaps I was wrong. All right, proceed. But remember, the three will be caught. Even if it takes endless years, Mars will catch them and punish them. I swear. For a long time, no one spoke. The ship lumbered through space again, its jets firing evenly, calmly moving the passengers toward their planet, toward home. Behind them, Deimos and the red ball that was Mars dropped farther and farther away each moment, disappearing and fading into the distance. A sigh of relief passed through the passengers. What a lot of hot air that was, one grumbled. Barbarians, a woman said. A few of them stood up, moving into the aisle toward the lounge and the cocktail bar. Beside Thatcher, the girl got to her feet, pulling her jacket around her shoulders. Pardon me, she said, stepping past him. Going to the bar? Thatcher said. Mind if I come along? I suppose not. They followed the others into the lounge, walking together up the aisle. You know, Thatcher said, I don't even know your name yet. My name is Mara Gordon. Mara? That's a nice name. What part of Terra are you from? North America? New York? I've been in New York, Mara said. New York is very lovely. She was slender and pretty with a cloud of dark hair tumbling down her neck against her leather jacket. They entered the lounge and stood undecided. Let's uh, sit at a table, Mara said, looking around at the people at the bar, mostly men. Perhaps that table over there? But someone's already there, Thatcher said. The heavy-set businessman had sat down at the table and deposited his sample case on the floor. Do we want to sit with him? Oh, it's all right, Mara said, crossing to the table. May we sit here? She said to the man. The man looked up, half-rising. It's a pleasure, he murmured. He studied Thatcher intently. However, a friend of mine will be joining me in a minute. I'm sure there's room enough for all of us, Mara said. She seated herself and Thatcher helped her with her chair. He sat down too, glancing up suddenly at Mara and the businessman. They were looking at each other, almost as if something had passed between them. The man was middle-aged, with a florid face and tired gray eyes. His hands were mottled, with veins showing thickly. At the moment, he was tapping nervously. My name's Thatcher, Thatcher said to him, holding out his hand. Bob Thatcher. Since we're going to be together for a while, we might as well get to know each other. The man studied him. Slowly, his hand came out. Why not? My name's Erickson. Ralph Erickson. Erickson, Thatcher smiled. You look like a commercial man to me. He nodded towards the sample case on the floor. Am I right? The man named Erickson started to answer. But at that moment, there was a stir. A thin man of about 30 had come up to the table, his eyes bright, staring down at them warmly. Well, we're on our way, he said to Erickson. Hello, Mara. He picked out a chair and sat down quickly, folding his hands on the table before him. He noticed Thatcher and drew back a little. Pardon me, he murmured. Bob Thatcher is my name. 
Thatcher said. I hope I'm not intruding here. He glanced around at the three of them. Mara alert, watching him intently. Heavy set Erickson, his face blank. And this person. Say, do you three know each other? He asked suddenly. There was silence. The robot attendants slid over soundlessly, poised to take their orders. Erickson roused himself. Let's see, uh, he murmured. What will we have? Mara? Mara? Whiskey and water. You, Jan? The bright, slim man smiled. The same. Thatcher? Gin and tonic. Whiskey and water for me also, Erickson said. The robot attendant went off. It returned at once with the drinks, setting them on the table. Each took his own. Well, Erickson said, holding up his glass. To our mutual success, all drank. Thatcher and the three of them, heavy said Erickson. Mara, her eyes nervous and alert. Jan, who had just come. Again, a look passed between Mara and Erickson. A look so swift that he could not have caught it had he not been looking directly at her. What line do you represent, Mr. Erickson? Thatcher asked. Erickson glanced at him, then down at the sample case on the floor. He grunted. Well, as you can see, I'm a salesman. Thatcher smiled. I knew it. You get so you can always spot a salesman right off by his sample case. A salesman always has to carry something to show. What are you in, sir? Erickson paused. He licked his thick lips, his eyes blank and lidded like a toad's. At last, he rubbed his mouth with his hand and reached down, lifting up the sample case. He set it on the table in front of him. Well, he said, perhaps we might even show, Mr. Thatcher. They all stared down at the sample case. It seemed to be an ordinary leather case, with a metal handle and a snap lock. I'm getting curious, Thatcher said. What's in there? You're all so tense. Diamonds? Stolen jewels? Jan laughed harshly, mirthlessly. Eric, put it down. We're not far enough away yet. Nonsense, Eric rumbled. We're away, Jan. Please, Mara whispered. Wait, Eric. Wait? Why? What for? You're so accustomed to... Eric, Mara said. She nodded towards Thatcher. We don't know him. Eric, please. He's a Terran, isn't he? Erickson... Erickson said. All Terrans are together in these times. He fumbled suddenly at the catch lock on the case. Yes, Mr. Thatcher. I'm a salesman. We're all salesmen, the three of us. Then you do know each other. Yes. Erickson nodded. His two companions sat rigidly, staring down. Yes, we do. Here, I'll show you our line. He opened the case. From it, he took a letter knife, a pencil sharpener, a glass globe paperweight, a box of thumbtacks, a stapler, some clips, a plastic ashtray, and some things Thatcher could not identify. He placed the objects in a row in front of him on the table. Then he closed the sample case. I gather you're in office supplies? Thatcher said. He touched the letter knife with his finger. Nice quality steel. Looks like Swedish steel to me. Erickson nodded, looking into Thatcher's face. Not really an impressive business, is it? Office supplies, ashtrays, paper clips. He smiled. Oh, Thatcher shrugged. Why not? They're a necessity in modern business. The only thing I wonder... What's that? Well, I wonder how you'd ever find enough customers on Mars to make it worth your while. He paused, examining the glass paperweight. He lifted it up, holding it to the light, staring at the scene within until Erickson took it out of his hand and put it back in the sample case. And another thing, if you three know each other, why did you sit apart when you got on? They looked at him quickly. And why didn't you speak to each other until we left Dimos? He leaned toward Erickson, smiling at him. Two men and a woman, three of you, sitting apart in the ship, not speaking until the check station was passed. I find myself thinking over what the Martian said. Three saboteurs, a woman and two men. Erickson put the thing back in the sample case. He was smiling, but his face had gone chalk white. Mara stared down, playing with a drop of water on the edge of a glass. Jan clenched his hands together nervously, blinking rapidly. You three are the ones the later was after, Thatcher said softly. You are the destroyers, the saboteurs. But the lie detector, why didn't it trap you? How did you get by that? And now you're safe outside the check station. He grinned, staring around at them. I'll be damned. And I really thought you were a salesman, Erickson. You really fooled me. Erickson relaxed a little. Well, Mr. Thatcher, it's in a good cause. I'm sure you have no love for Mars either. No Terran does. And I see you're leaving with the rest of us. 
True, Thatcher said. You must certainly have an interesting account to give, the three of you. He looked around the table. We still have an hour or so of travel. Sometimes it gets dull, this Mara Terra run. Nothing to see, nothing to do but sit and drink in the lounge. He raised his eyes slowly. Any chance you'd like to spin a story to keep us awake? Jan and Mara looked at Erickson. Go on, Jan said. He knows who we are. Tell him the rest of the story. You might as well, Mara said. Jan let out a sigh suddenly, a sigh of relief. <sighs> Let's put the cards on the table. Get this weight off us. I'm tired of sneaking around, slipping. Sure, Erickson said expansively. Why not? He settled back in his chair, unbuttoning his vest. Certainly, Mr. Thatcher. I'll be glad to spin you a story, and I'm sure it will be interesting enough to keep you awake.